I hope this podcast finds you well during this difficult time. This is Antibody, a three-part series on life and politics under COVID-19 from The Dig and Jacobin Magazine. I'm your host, Daniel Denver. Recently, I called my friend Nikhil Saval, who I've known for a while. Do you remember that night at your house? We are going to go out somewhere, far, far enough away that we wanted a vehicle to take us. And I proposed requesting a lift on my iPhone, but you insisted that we not call what you called a scab cab. And instead, you insisted on calling an actual taxi service from your landline. Do you remember what happened? Yes, I remember that. I remember the night when you wanted to call a scab cab. You wanted to call a lift. That is Nikhil. And, you know, I. Not really call one, summon one. To summon one using your, your app. Nikhil and I have known each other since 2013. I was a reporter at Philadelphia City Paper, and he was a volunteer for Unite Here Local 634, which represents cafeteria workers and noontime aides in Philly public schools. At the time, the schools were facing devastating cuts in a privatization campaign. And Nikhil called me to try to talk me into covering a protest. I was a left-wing reporter, so activists often pitched me stories. When Nikhil called, I didn't have any clue that he was also an editor at the literary magazine N Plus One. And I turned him down on his pitch. But we soon became friends anyway. Back to that night when I tried to summon a lift. You wanted to summon a lift using your, your app. Yeah, what I tried to do was call a taxi service, and I was put on hold for quite a long time. And in, the, in that interim, I th- intervening period, I think the lift showed up. At that time, Nikhil didn't use apps. He had a landline and a pink razor flip phone. You know, it, it's forever changed my, my view of your politics for the worse, in the sense that <laughs> there's nothing... There, I. It's one thing to call Uber or Lyft, but it's one thing to be one of those people that insists that Lyft is better. I think that's like a, that's really that's really deplorable. Like it's just a, a false idea of of what politics is. By the time I met Nikhil in 2013, being a political activist was becoming harder to do without a smartphone. Take emojis, for example. There was a city council person here, uh, Helen Gim, who relied very frequently on these emojis. So I would send her a text about something and then she would respond and it would just be these black blocks of text. I would think like, what did she send? It was like redacted by low tech. <laughs> it was re- yeah, these were, there were these redacted text messages. And so I had to forward them to my, to my wife, to Shannon, and she would tell me their fists or their thumbs up. As essays and reviews and everything Nikhil edited and wrote migrated online, so did left-wing organizing. So did everything and everyone. Nikhil somehow remained in the middle of it all, but on his own terms, waging this permanent protest, not so much against technology, but against how technology in the hands of capitalists was reconfiguring social relations. It was really self-protection. I am a writer and I need circumspection, I need time to myself and I need time to my own thoughts. And I saw people around me succumbing to this stupid, you know, black monolith device. And I saw this destroying, it destroyed the best minds of my generation, (laughs) I think. I'm not even that concerned, honestly, about its surveillance and the fact that it's like recording you secretly. I mean, that's really what you should be concerned about. But personally, I'm not, it doesn't hit me at a gut level. It's just that it, it ambiently ruins the physical universe, and it tries to swallow up everything in our world into it. Nikhil did not get a smartphone when he became a leader in Reclaim Philadelphia, an organization that grew out of the 2016 Bernie campaign in the city. He did not get one when his organization orchestrated left-wing takeovers of two ward committees, when he became a ward leader. Philadelphia is a city with a storied democratic machine, and Nikhil, a left-wing Bernie person, was in charge of one of its pillars— he was a socialist ward boss navigating the upper reaches of the city power structure. But still, no smartphone. And then, finally, last year, he decided to run for state senate. And he got a smartphone. Yeah, group texts. They suck. But sometimes they're fun, but, but like, not that fun. Like, my life, other things are more fun than group texts. Things that you would be doing instead of group texting are way better. Like, reading and whatever. This dude sacrifices for the cause. If the movement requires him to get a smartphone, he'll get a damn smartphone. 
In recent years, national media has focused a lot on the left's big wins in Congress. People like AOC, Ilhan Omar, and Rashida Tlaib. And national media has also spent a lot of time noting that we've struggled to win a lot of other races. What doesn't get as much attention are the successes at the city level. And Philadelphia is a big success story. Left activists have put Helen Gim and Kendra Brooks on city council, helped make civil rights lawyer Larry Krasner DA, and public radio journalist Liz Fiedler state rep. Reclaim played a serious role in all of that. Now, they're running to kill for state senate. A big part of how Reclaim Philly and left-wing activists win these elections, the way they beat the money power, is with people power. Specifically, by canvassing, which means knocking on strangers' doors and talking to them about politics. And that's what Reclaim was doing in mid-March. We had 90 volunteer shifts scheduled for that weekend. Um, the local AFL-CIO had just declined to endorse our opponent, but to decline to endorse Farnese, a 12-year incumbent. So it was a huge burst of momentum behind us. And then everything shut down. We realized that we were going to have to cancel all of them. You're listening to Antibody, a special series from The Dig and Jacobin magazine. What a weird and bad moment. It seems like time isn't moving at all, yet also that is moving way too fast. We started putting this together a couple months ago, in the weeks after coronavirus upended the world and our lives. Since then, more than 100,000 Americans have died. More than 40 million have lost their jobs. If you're a regular Dig listener, You've heard me conduct lengthy interviews, often on books about American history, politics, here and everywhere, imperialism, racism, capitalism, gender, theory. With Antibody, we're taking the Dig's politics and putting them into stories and soundscapes, with not just interviews, but fiction and narrative and in-depth reporting about the personal and political dimensions of the COVID-19 crisis. Humanity isn't the enemy, it's the Antibody. Back to Nikhil. So soon after acquiring a smartphone, you are experiencing so much of the world entirely through phones and screens. You're like you're running, you're living your life and running your campaign through like the most extreme Black Mirror esque critique that you would have had of screen t- life. Yes, I will say that the the people make reference to Black Mirror, which is not a show I've seen, and I don't really watch TV. So I, I but I I would say. Yes, I, we are now running an extremely digital campaign and I make videos and I go on Instagram live and obviously I'm on Zoom calls and we have Zoom town halls constantly. A big book. It's a big book. We had Nikhil record some slices from his life now, from his house. Yellow. Yellow. Platypus. Purpose. The place he reads books with his baby and makes pancakes. Flip. Do those look done to you? is now the same place he's launching Zoom Town Halls. Um, thank you so much, Rick. Uh, thank you all for attending our, our joint town Sorry. Together first. Um, making fundraising calls. Okay, how much did I ask for? 500. Okay. There is a kind of somberness to all of it. It's, it's, le- it's leavening over time as we get, get used to it. But I've been on a lot of town halls where we're constantly just addressing the terribleness of this situation. And so... That's my principal experience of it. I, I think the only things that have been different have been kind of Zoom happy hours that I've had with people, which have been unexpectedly, like, fine. You know, as everyone, I think, has noted, you you end up talking to people because you were like, I guess, I'll, I, guess I might as well call my friend in Australia. Like, they, they're essentially at the same distance. It suddenly equalize the geographic space. You know, the same thing that's happened with our field program. I can't even knock the doors of my own neighbors. But I've contacted thousands of people in the district. I just haven't done it geographically. These town halls that we run, they maybe have 100 people attending, which it's, it's very difficult to do in person. But it is possible to do it online. And people have very few barriers to attending because what else are they doing? <laughs> you mentioned that like older people in the neighborhood are on Facebook and younger ones on Twitter. And then I'm, I'm sure there are all kinds of other people who just aren't online at all or you don't really... How do you, you know, how do you find them? This has been the most difficult. One of the last things I was going to do was going to be going to church down the street with one of my neighbors, with a largely black congregation. 
you know, and I, I didn't, I decided not to go, um, because it was like, I thought it was a largely elderly population and that was, that was a risk. I didn't know if I was asymptomatic or not. And we, anyway, it was just a thing I couldn't do. You can't, it's hard to replicate that. This goes back to my hostility to this, to a lot of these technologies. They can supplement and they can be provisional and they can also create new experiences. They can create new extensions of ourselves. And, uh, but I, I fundamentally prefer the, the physical, tangible world. Um, and, and that includes physical, tangible people. And it turns out that people in Nikhil's neighborhood, their lives and the problems that they face remain quite tangible, even as our non-household social realities moved online. People can't afford rent. People are out of work. Or they're working in a frontline job that's holding our society together with low pay and too little protection. And so I think that has been, you know, has probably opened a lot of people's eyes in the extent that we government can act to a degree that it was it was perceived not to be able to act. You, we can stop evictions. We can release people from pretrial incarceration. We can stop utility shutoffs. Like Kianga Yamada Taylor pointed out, you know, then this invites the question: When is it ever a good idea? to shut off someone's access to potable water. That is true. I think you can pose that question more acutely now than you could before. But that sentiment still has to be organized. It can't just be posed. It can't just be felt. It has to be organized and directed. Because he was limited to tapping out slow texts on his pink razor for so long, Nikhil has always spent a lot of time talking on the phone, organizing, fundraising. And these days he's still doing that. But the phone calls have changed. So our first instinct to call when you call someone is less, will you vote for Nikhil Saval, but how are you doing? What do you need? And that's just what you have to ask. It's what you just, it's not even like a, you, you don't really have to even be trained into doing that. And then it turns out people have very stark answers to that that are sobering. And you can't just let that hang. You can't just be like, I'm sorry. You have to do something about it. And so you have to connect people to grocery delivery or to tenants' rights representation or things like that. So we've managed to fulfill lots of requests. Um, that's what resonates, I think. When I first met Nikhil in 2013, it was about a year after immigrant rights activists won DACA, two years after Occupy Wall Street. 13 years after the Nader campaign and the high point of the anti-globalization movement, and 10 years after the anti-Iraq war protest movement had exploded only to quickly fizzle. It was about a year before Black Lives Matter erupted on the streets of Ferguson, two years before Bernie announced his first campaign, and three years before Standing Rock and a year consumed by Bernie's shocking insurgency and Trump's capture of the Republican nomination and then the presidency, which in turn gave birth to groups like Reclaim Philadelphia, and sparked DSA's enormous growth. Right now, I'm disappointed that Bernie's campaign sputtered out. But in Philadelphia and everywhere, people have gotten back to work. In Rhode Island, where I live, I'm in the process of helping turn our state's volunteer campaign for Bernie into a permanent organization to build left-wing power here. After a month of getting a grip on the new pandemic reality, we regrouped on Zoom. We had a few weekly meetings, and then we decided to name our organization Reclaim Rhode Island and model our work off what Nikhil and his comrades have been doing in Philly. I called Nikhil to make sure they were okay with us stealing the name. If you want to get involved in Nikhil's campaign, go to NikhilSaval.com. N-I-K-I-L-S-A-V-A-L. Com. You can find out more about Reclaim Philly at reclaimphiladelphia.org and Reclaim Rhode Island at reclaimri.org. Producer Ari Mejia, like a lot of us, found herself stuck inside for the past couple of months in her small Chicago apartment. Just outside the city, her friend Patrice is serving a life sentence at the Joliet Treatment Center. Back in March, the two talked on the phone just as COVID was starting to hit prisons around the country. Here's Ari. About three weeks into quarantine, my wife discovered a long, 
winding trail of tiny brown ants on our living room floor. We searched the perimeter of the room, getting on hands and knees to find the source of the colony. We didn't find it. We just continuously noticed more and more ants, sometimes in a row, sometimes in chaos, frantically trying to get away from us. This one day, after the ant discovery, I was sitting in front of our living room open window on a particularly sad day in this quarantine. I was missing my mom. I was missing my friends. I was missing dates in the park and restaurants and all of it, you name it people and interactions that sum up the parts of my life that make me whole. I'm sitting there, I'm grieving, and every time I look down to the floor, like an impulse, I find myself squashing these ants individually and quickly, my index finger pressing into their vulnerable, harmless little insect bodies, successfully squashing them between my flesh and the hardwood floor. All of a sudden, I'm outside of my body and I'm watching myself compulsively kill these ants, and I'm immediately disgusted. And I start wondering if my ant squashing is because of this need for control and my desire for agency, because I can't just do what I want like before. I'm here, I'm staring out this open window, and this is where I'll be all day long for days on end. Patrice, can you hear me? Yep. yep okay. I can. Okay, great. Okay, hi. Um, something that I forgot to ask you. Would you mind introducing yourself? Uh, say your name and just when you introduce yourself to folks, what just like really chill. Oh, well. <laughs> my name is Patrice. I am 44 years old, so I'll be 45, June 17th. I've been in prison now <clears throat> um, as an adult um, since I was 18. Patrice, um, my brilliant Gemini friend. He's serving I, um, a life sentence at the I Joliet Treatment Center in Illinois. Without possibility of parole. Um, <clears throat> I met him through my friend Debbie, who became his pen pal thanks to the organization Black and Pink back in 2013. Things got real for me when I was watching the, uh, the news and I began to see what was going on at Shakeville. You know what I mean? I saw a news broadcast on, from, on um, Fox 32 News that said coronavirus outbreak at Stateville Prison. You know, me having been to Stateville countless times, most recently in 2016, I, you know, it, it, just, it just really struck me like, like I said, you know, this is real. You know, people um, um, could potentially die that I know. The reality is that uh, uh, this crisis has sort of exposed a crisis that already existed before this crisis, which is the crisis of incarceration. So I would argue that this crisis highlights sort of, um, I guess, the sort of the core, the, the disgusting core essence of imprisonment in the first place. The insidiousness of incarceration is manifested in that social distancing is almost an imposs- impossibility under these conditions because staff members are, and people who work here are constantly coming in and out of the facility every day. In and out of the facility every day, every day, every day, every day, in and out, in and out, in and out. today, I am going to get up and willingly walk 70 paces to a door, have someone unlock it, I go in and they close it, and and not resist that at any point. How imprisonment and how incarceration operates and functions 
at its core, it's diabolical when you really think about it. For any amount of time, and I mean more than, you know, six months or a year, you have to at some point as an employee not see my humanity. You know, remove, I, I think, I think, I think, the, I guess the evil genius of incarceration is how people tie in what is labeled and characterized as criminality to sort of the diabolical nature of incarceration as a means of making it permissible. Locking human beings in rooms that they can't exit it's evil. It's devious. It's um this this really think about it, like how bizarre that is. How unusual that is. My out of body self re enters my flesh and I stop smashing the ants. Right then and there. I stop. Remind me of my worth. And so much of life, my life has been about devaluing my worth. It's been about reinforcing the worst things I thought about myself. You remind me of the best things to think about myself. And so the reality of it is that you know, man, like there are real living, breathing people in these cages, man, who need love and attention and visitation and affection and phone calls. And that in fact, they're brothers and their uncles and aunties and baby mamas and cousins and friends and lovers and all the rest, man. And then I just stopped noticing them. It's like they turned invisible. Or maybe as naturally as I don't notice the air, they've become a part of me, part of this room. What is an instinct? What is innate? What is learned? This moment tugs on the roots, both deep and shallow, that live in me, in all Americans. The pedestal where individualism lives, a nature as dense as bones, laying dormant under a fabric woven thick, binding the tendons, stiffening our limbs. The desire for control, a luxury, an illusion. Even the ants are reminding me. The work of deep stretching as a constant confrontation. Any, 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 Thank please. you for using oh, Secure. Love you, Goodbye. Love you, Bye. Love you. Goodbye. That piece was produced by Ari Mejia. Special thanks to Patrice, whose generosity and assistance made the story possible. At least 455 incarcerated people have died of coronavirus. In some prisons, more than 60% of inmates have tested positive. The murder of George Floyd makes it all too clear. We are not all in the same boat. We never have been. Lately, there's a new category of Facebook group. Maybe you've been lucky enough not to encounter them, but many of you no doubt have. They're for unemployed people trying to access benefits while navigating their state's impossibly Byzantine bureaucratic systems, sometimes calling hundreds of times. Some of the posts on these pages are sweet commiseration. Some are angry rants and once in a blue moon, a success story. Ian Lewis recently had to navigate his state's unemployment system as did his neighbor, Caroline Canner. She called the Texas unemployment hotline a bunch of times and couldn't get through. So Caroline and Ian were inspired to call into a hotline of their own making from a universe only slightly more Kafkaesque than our own. Welcome to your state's Department of Labor Telephone Unemployment Insurance Claims Helpline. To continue in English, press 1. Para continuar en español. Main menu. For information on the last payment made on your claim, press 1. To file or reopen a claim using our streamlined automated filing system, press 2. To speak with a representative, press 3.
If you are an employee, okay, speak with a representative. Due to COVID-19, we are experiencing a higher than usual call volume. In the interest of fairness, we have created a little game. I'm thinking of a number between 1 and 10,000. If you can guess it, you will be connected to a real live human being. Please enter your guess, followed by the pound sign. That is not the number. Sorry. Main menu. For information on the last payment made on your claim, press 1. To file or reopen a claim using our streamlined automated filing system, press 2. Okay, please hold as we connect you to our automated filing system. Did you know you can also hang up and file a claim online at https colon forward slash forward slash www.yourstate.gov forward slash ui underscore j l equal sign k s percentage sign a for x dollar sign question mark. Did you know your state has a budget deficit of $7 billion? Every time someone applies for unemployment insurance, this deficit grows. You can help shrink the deficit by hanging up and getting a job. Remember, it will be your children. Welcome to the automated filing system. The standard base period for determining claims is the first four of the last five completed calendar quarters. If you do not qualify under the standard base period, you may qualify under the alternative base period, consisting of the last three of the first four completed moon cycles prior to the beginning of the claim. When you file, you'll be asked to provide the following information. Your nine-digit social security number, your name, your employment history for the last 18 months, including dates of work and wages earned, your driver's license or state identification number, number of dependents, number of those dependents born outside of wedlock, whether or not you have purchased an iPhone in the last five years, and mailing address. If you are ready to provide this information and admit your personal failure, press 3. Press 3 to admit your personal failure. Are you still there? Please make a selection or your call will be disconnected. Okay, personal information. Please enter your nine-digit social security number followed by the pound sign. Congratulations. Our surveillance system has already gathered all further necessary personal information. We will now calculate your weekly benefit payment, taking into account your irresponsible personal behavior, frivolous spending, and chronic laziness. Your weekly benefit payment is $12.03. Your first payment will process in three to six months. If you would like to appeal this claim, you will need your 11-digit claim reference number and a fax machine. Stay on the line if you would like to receive your 11-digit claim reference number. Your 11-digit claim reference number is 187. That story was written and voiced by Caroline Canner and Ian Lewis, and produced by Ian. Ian, by the way, was eventually able to get unemployment benefits, but Caroline was rejected. 
We paid them both for the story. In the past two weeks, things have somewhat calmed down in New York City. The hotspots have shifted. In some ways, it feels like the settling, the aftermath. Jacobin assistant editor Alex Press wrote an essay reflecting on those early weeks when the city first got turned upside down, and what it means that we can never go back to normal. It was this very distinct moment of processing everything going so wrong, so fast in such a big way, that I keep thinking back to it. It'll stick with me forever, even as the rest of this period feels like such undifferentiated time. Here's Alex. My dad calls me and says two weeks. He's a respiratory therapist, and that's how long he suspects it'll take for Pittsburgh's hospitals to get overwhelmed by corona cases. It's April 1st, about two weeks into lockdown in New York City, and he's worried about me. He wants to rent me a room in Millvale, he says. Millvale is a mill town turned hip locale just outside Pittsburgh. I nix this plan, explaining that fleeing New York is antisocial behavior. My dad insists on mailing me some gloves to wear when I go to the grocery store. He tells me about a gunshot wound victim in his hospital unit. Not a coronavirus case, he jokes. He's worked in the ER for years. He can be dark. I ask him if he's heard about John Prine. Articles have just come out saying he's sick with the virus. He has. My dad was never much of a Prine fan, he says, but once in the 70s, he read a Rolling Stone story about Prine that mentioned that he used to be a mail carrier. Prine would occasionally take shelter from the snow in the mailroom's relay box to write songs. My dad tells me he's always loved this story. Being in New York during the coronavirus crisis is concerning. That week, the week I called my dad, they had started building field hospitals in Central Park and in a stadium in Queens. They had turned the Empire State Building into a flashing red siren. People were dying while trying to get into hospitals, dying in hospitals, attempting suicide because their cancer treatments had been delayed to clear room for coronavirus patients. If you got sick, the hospital suddenly no longer seemed to be an option. The state's governor was holding press conferences where he said he wouldn't entertain a bill to suspend rent, even though the New York Times estimated that 40% of New Yorkers might be unable to pay. In late March, as I was sitting on my stoop, a little girl had walked up to me, an umbrella shielding her from the early morning drizzle. Do you have any money for sandwiches? She asked. My mom is out of work and me and my sisters are going hungry. I handed her the money I had on me and weakly wished her good luck. The jails were completely unprepared for the virus, and the authorities were taking their time releasing people. They did, however, offer prisoners $6 an hour to dig mass graves. Because I dabble in journalism, construction workers were texting me several times a day about how filthy their job sites were. A reporter tweeted, that while 332 people died of coronavirus on March 31st in New York, by that point, the rate of increase had been steady rather than rising for a couple days. I tried to feel relieved. Later, after I call my dad, I walk to CVS to pick up medication. There's a line of six or seven people, mostly older, all with masks, standing on the sidewalk, waiting to enter the store. I walk to the back of the line and cover my face with a keffiyeh. I have no idea where people are getting masks. That same day, we hold a staff meeting via Zoom. Coworkers are scattered around the world, calling in from Istanbul, London, Dublin, Berlin, Toronto. Several of us live in buildings going on rent strike. I think about my laid-off roommate, a bartender. Everyone in my apartment has agreed not to pay this month. I take notes for a coworker quarantining in Australia, asleep as we're talking. As my coworkers discuss the financial state of our publication and Tiger King, I stare at a photo strip I picked up on the floor of a Manhattan karaoke bar last year that has, during the meeting, freed itself from a pile of papers near my desk. 
Two strangers look back at me, making silly faces, cocktails in hand. That week, my job as a writer had been feeling meaningless, emptier than usual. I kept thinking about this essay. In it, the author, Jed Purdy, is reflecting on his failed efforts to avoid being commodified as a young writer. He says, I realize now that I was trying to undo by writing what could only be undone by action, not alone, but with others, and through connections that incantation alone would not conjure. Maybe writing feels this way because action is so much more important. The wave of walkouts and sickouts by workers at Amazon, General Electric, Whole Foods, and more, not to mention the tenant organizing, are what we need now. Writing isn't totally useless, of course. The future is open. But when the system is so hostile to reform, much less radical change, no amount of correct phrasing or clever proposals can shape history. The critic James Wood writes about what he calls secular homelessness. He says, To think about home and the departure from home, about not going home and no longer feeling able to go home, is to be filled with a remarkable sense of afterwardness. It is too late to do anything about it now and too late to know what should have been done. Afterwardness. For me, that word saturates the present. I think about April 1st. The day I called my dad, walked to the CVS, sat in on the Zoom meeting. The day rent was due and I didn't pay it. That week, everything felt new, like a new era, one we didn't know we were entering until it arrived. Things that had been unthinkable, 30% unemployment, were now possible. A lot of what came before feels irrevocably distant or distorted, hazy. The past had a fog and we didn't even know it. Only now, amid the pandemic, is the fragility of our way of living blindingly obvious. We face the facts, and in doing so, we transform what came before. We can never go back. My dad's still working in the hospital. For a while, he was thinking about renting the room in Millvale himself, in case he had to isolate away from my mom. He didn't end up doing it. The pandemic didn't hit Pittsburgh as hard as we'd expected. Or at least, it hasn't yet. His hospital has coronavirus cases, and not nearly enough PPE. But so far, no major disasters. He's still calling to check on me in New York. Fewer people are dying each day than a month ago. Still, it's more than 20,000 people in the city total. Last time we talked, I told my dad, no matter what they're doing outside now, almost everyone wears masks. If you don't know, I have another podcast, an interview show called The Dig. This series is focused on the U.S., but that's obviously just one portion of a global story about a global pandemic. And we have done a bunch of shows on both the global and domestic politics of what's going on. You can check out The Dig at thedigradio.com. And you can support us at patreon.com slash the dig. We have so many exciting stories lined up for this series. Chenjirai Kumanika on Amazon Warehouse Workers, Andrea Long Chu on Dungeons and Dragons, Samuel Delaney on Stranger Pleasure, a rent strike in Oakland, the Siberian anarchist history of mutual aid, medical organizing, day laborers, and more. We are so excited to bring you those stories in future episodes. We can only do our regular podcast and put out this COVID special because listeners, people just like you, support us. If you do have a steady source of income and can afford to, please contribute what you can. Plus, if you contribute at least $10 a month, we will send you a left-wing book or books in the mail. We have many to choose from. That is p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash the dig. Next up, our final story. Because of the pandemic, it's often too risky to go to doctor's offices or clinics right now. And a lot of people around the world just aren't going. Or they're relying on DIY medical care. In the U.S., trans people have had to do that pretty much forever. 
This piece is from producers Arlie Adlington and Cass Adair. You're in the muscle after like um, three quarters of an inch or something. It's not that deep. You don't have to go that deep. And like I said, you can usually feel the feeling of like, oh, there's something slightly more hard. And those needles are super long, so you can use them as a gauge. Like, if you push that needle all the way in, you're definitely in a muscle. There's no question. And I just try to do it, like, yeah, two-thirds of the way in to 75% of the way in is also fine. Like, that's okay. Um, So you can do an intramuscular injection with a one-inch needle, and it'll work. So, like, that's how I keep myself knowing. Like, that's about how deep it has to go. Do you think I should do my injection, like, now while we're on the call? Yeah, sure. I'm in my bedroom in London, video calling my friend Cass. Well, what if I, yeah, Yeah, I'll I'll just just demo demo it. it. Then you can do it with me. We can do it together. Okay. He's sitting on his bedroom floor in Virginia. So I keep my stuff in, this is a case for slides. (laughs) Um, and then I have like all these little vials and sometimes I keep needles in here too. Our friend Tuck was also on the call, sleepily watching from bed in Portland. I am awake and I downloaded Skype and I made a new Skype account because the chance of me remembering my password. It's our own personal international trans person helpline. I think we have like different things in the UK. Oh, interesting. Like, you, how often do you do yours? So I do mine once a week. I I do mine. People do them very differently. I don't My know doctor normally does my testosterone shots every three weeks at the surgery near my house. A doctor did my first shot, and my girlfriend at the time did a few after that. But then I had to learn how to do it on my own. In the US, you can't just go to clinics all the time. You're supposed to take care of yourself. Since my last injection, coronavirus escalated massively. Yeah, when I was at my doctor's the last time, he was like, the surgery might close, so you might not be able to come in. But we agreed that I'd probably be able to get my shot one way or the other, like as long as I could get the testosterone from the pharmacy. And But with yeah. the conversation we had was like, I can either come here or if it's closed, I might be able to go to, there's this really amazing, it's mainly a sexual health clinic for queer people. And then I was like, and if that's closed, I'll be able to find, like, another trans person to do it. And the thing, like, neither of us thought ahead about was the possibility that we'd be in a full-on lockdown. Someone can't come into our house and I can't go into their house. So, yeah. Yeah. There's no way. I know. It's just one of the many things you can't anticipate about health that, like, breaks down. Now the only way I can get my shot is if I do it myself. But no one's ever taught me how. So I text Cass and Tuck and ask for help. So when I open the little box, it looks like this. Oh, wow, that looks so much more like science than mine. And then I guess I need to, like... So how do you put that into a needle (laughs) or into a syringe? I don't know. (laughs) All right, we're going to figure this out. No, I think you must... must My friend Aaron James taught me how to inject myself. They sat with me on the floor of their apartment, and they took me through the whole process step by step. I actually have a bad needle phobia, and I was terrified that I was going to pass out alone, bleeding out with a needle in my thigh. When I was more of a baby about it, it helped me to write it down and just be like, here's all the steps. And then feel like really in control of it and be like, I know what all the steps are and I'm not going to fuck them up. So I do mine in my thigh, which is where a lot of people self-inject. And I can show you what I was taught about how to do that. Um, let me see if I can show you on my body. So... Trans people are always helping other trans people learn how to do medical stuff. That's true all over the world, even when there isn't a global pandemic happening. In the U.S. especially, where so many of us don't have health insurance, we're always each other's nurses and doctors and caregivers. The other thing that I do that's different is that I, rather than stab, like, rather than doing, like, a thrust motion, I don't do that because that's too scary. I can, mm-hmm. like, I will just stop my hand before yeah. I have them and then actually do it. Um, so I just, like, my friend taught me this, um, is you can just push 
you can just put the needle right up on your skin. So I don't know if you can see well, but like literally I can just take the needle and push it where it needs to go and then slide it in. In a way, how trans people access medical care in the U.S., it's kind of a microcosm of how the whole system works. It's something that you can buy if you have money, and if you don't, it's something that you fundraise for, or beg for, or hustle for, or you just do without. Or learn to teach each other. Um, you just did the flicking it thing that doctors do on the TV shows. Yeah, what's that, that doctors do on the TV shows? Yeah, exactly. It's hundred percent like that. So it's literally like I'm. I was supposed to do it when I had the needle on. I just don't always remember it, but like it's just to get little air bubbles in. If you flick it, then the little tiny air bubbles pop. Okay. Um. Sometimes you can ask your doctor. I don't know how this works with socialized medicine, but sometimes you can ask your doctor to like give you a different gauge. Like when we talked about it a couple of weeks later, I realized Cass was feeling jealous at points during this video call. If it weren't for this pandemic, I could have gone to my doctor to get this shot. Indefinitely, if I wanted to. That's not how it works in the US. Sometimes I get angry with trans people who live in countries with public medical systems. An Australian friend told me recently that there's this clinic in her neighborhood that gives out hormones to trans people. Any trans person, no questions asked. Sometimes I fantasize about what my bank account would look like if I still had the $6,000 that I spent on top surgery, or if I didn't send random amounts of money to trans people's medical GoFundMes all the time. I don't feel defensive about Cass's jealousy or anger that he lives in a country with such a messed up healthcare system. I know how lucky I am to have the NHS, the National Health Service. But when we talked about this later, I did point out I have the exact same six grand shaped hole in my bank account from paying for my top surgery. And lots of other big holes from various private psychiatrist and endocrinologist appointments. Because while, yeah, I can get my regular shots with my doctor, I've still paid out of pocket for all my transition related healthcare. Sometimes I wonder what it would be like if the people I love weren't constantly struggling just to exist in their bodies in this country that doesn't want them to live. It's hard to talk about because I love the NHS and I'm so grateful to have it. But trans healthcare is maybe one of the worst bits of the whole system. Getting help as a trans person in the UK is really hard. It's not fair that my country only wants rich people to be healthy. One of the main gender identity clinics here was recently estimating a five-year waiting list for starting treatment. And people in other countries get to go to the doctor whenever they want. I'm extremely lucky that with help from my family, I was able to stump up the money and just go private for my surgery and hormones. And that I happen to stumble on a local doctor who's never tried to stand in the way of my transition. I'm angry a lot of the time. But also, I've been lucky to have a community that shows up for me. My barriers to healthcare have put me in touch with this powerful network of solidarity. And right now, we're in the midst of this crisis where it seems like everyone, not just undocumented people, not just gig workers, disabled people, poor people, trans people, Everyone has to fend for themselves. So those of us who have been doing it forever, it feels like we have something we can share. It's helpful to have this. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you for showing me. <laughs> it, just, it makes me feel really good that I can. This is like a thing I can actually help with. <laughs> oh, it's, it's actually really good to have that. Carly, how do you feel about it? I think I feel like having this conversation made me realise for the first time I actually do have to give myself an injection. <laughs> I'm very like a person that like doesn't worry too much about a thing until the thing is happening. But now the thing's happening and I'm like, oh right, like there are so many elements to this thing. Including yeah. putting a needle in me. I didn't end up doing my shot on the call because we were talking during my lunch break and I didn't want to rush it. But later that evening, I had to do it. (sighs) 
I got out my needles and syringes to prep the injection. I tried to remember what Cass told me to do, and to imagine him there with me. But what I do is I like to like tense my muscles really hard, like squeeze my muscles. And then let go. Shit. Just to like fatigue the muscles a little bit before I have to like inject something in them. Tense and release. Tense and release. Tense and, and release. release. When I was finally set up, I realised I was going to have to turn to my relaxing Rain Sounds app, which I'd been using to sleep when coronavirus existential dread was keeping me awake. when the shot is actually in my muscle. Like, I know what that feels like. You don't have to go all the way in, either. People think you have to go quite far, but you actually don't. You only have to go about, like, two-thirds of the way in. So I just stop whenever I feel like I'm inside the muscle, because I get scared otherwise, so I just stop. And then you pull back just a little bit. This is supposed to be to check to see if you're injecting right into a vein, but also it helps get a little air in to make pushing in, pushing the stuff in easier. And then you just push the plunger down. And I take another deep breath here. Pull it out straight, straight out. That story was produced by Cassidy and Arlie Adlington. Antibody is produced by Liza Yeager and Mitchell Johnson. Music by Jeffrey Brodsky, Blue Dot Sessions, and Waves. Our artwork is by Alex Hainsworth. Special thanks to our regular dig team. That's Alex Lewis, Julia Rock, Zachary Nin, and Thea Rio Francos. You can follow us on Twitter at The Dig Radio and subscribe to both this show and The Dig wherever you get podcasts. Leave us a review on iTunes or wherever because those reviews ostensibly help introduce us to new listeners. But what really does that is spreading the word to your friends. Please, make propaganda for us. And do find us at patreon.com slash the dig and make a monthly contribution to help keep this operation up and running strong. Even a few bucks is huge. 
We'll be back next week with episode two. 